And welcome to Nerdstalker. I am Adolfo Ferranda, at Nerdstalker on Twitter, at all the places, nerdstalker.com, and YouTube, and subscribe, and all the stuff in iTunes, with a very special guest, and a really author of a very cool book, Surfing the Black Wave. Look at that. Brand leadership in a di digital age, Dan Cobb. So let me tell you a little bit about Daniel. Daniel Bryan Cobb is an Emmy Award winning advertising exec, keynote speaker, and business strategist who has partnered with some of the world's most remarkable brands for nearly three decades, such as Disney, Warner Brothers, Chick fil A, Coca Cola. Cobb founded Daniel Bryan Advertising, DBA, as an, in, as an intent to reinvent the marketing industry, and his motto is better brands for a better human condition. He also serves on the board of the Make a Wish Foundation, as well as California based missions me and Angel House Orphanages, and his new book, Surfing the Black Wave, Brand Leadership in a Digital Age, is awesome. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you. Well, excited to be here. All right. Yeah, so Dan, so much. Uh, is, as we were saying before in the show, I had such a good time reading the book. I can't wait to read even more. Um, there, it's so timely, right? You've positioned this book in, in at the perfect point in time, sort of I feel, in the, the history of this of this industry, really. Um, one, of the th one of the things that you mentioned in the book is, say, your brand won't be able to buy space on these new consumer networks because your competition invented them. Now, before you answer that, please tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we can go into that. Great. Uh, well, I've been in the advertising business since before there was an internet, so I got in this, <laughs> in this industry thinking I was going to make Super Bowl commercials for a living. And uh, sure enough, after I made mm -hmm. my first one, I kind of lost interest in, in the experience of that and said, what else is there? What else can we do that's going to create effectiveness? And as the digital innovation started changing the industry, we looked at what was changing uh, the way we would engage consumers and not looking at it from a sense of buy media and put content in media, but how do we reach a consumer in the way they want to be connected with and today it's changed so much that apps uh, are very much becoming advertising and, and content is very much becoming uh, long form, short form, every form of content to reach a customer way beyond what we traditionally called advertising. It's entertainment now. It's video games. The, the gamification of everything is changing the way we experience all of our brands and the way we experience them from an, a marketing perspective is to say, how does the customer want to be reached? And so we change everything according to that process. It's, it's so interesting. You have so much good stuff here um, in terms of how the whole industry has changed. As you said, so much of it is in, based in neuroscience now that with all the things that we're learning, it seems like across the board, I'm talking to all these different authors in various different verticals, and neuroscience seems to be at the core of so much of it. Um, yeah. So let's touch on another part here. You said uh, marketing is not just about advertising anymore. It never was. It's about creating platforms of influence for, uh, for your brand. What does that mean? Uh, that means that uh, advertising as a model has become almost like a factory model. Many times agencies think, okay, we have a new client. Let's make our TV commercial. Let's make our banner ads. And the problem in that kind of thinking is that you can very much equalize what your, what your competition's doing with those same kinds of ads. One pizza company has a $5 pizza, the next pizza company has a $5 pizza. And all in the same media, all the same channels, you're not really making a differentiation in the way you're talking to your customer. So we now look at everything. We look at the way, for example, Hungry Howie's Pizza, the way they represented their brand was as important as the sale itself. And we looked at the month of October, for example, and turned the box pink in that month. When we turned the box pink, what happened was sales went up 23%. Online engagement grew by a quarter million fans very, very quickly because mm -hmm. people are taking pictures of that box and saying, hey, this is cool. I kind of like the way this box looks. And by the way, I, I want to buy a product that stands for something. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to share that with my friends. And a lot of what we used to think about advertising and technology was it was all about better gadgets and better whiz bang applications. Well, a, a pink pizza box isn't necessarily a gadget of social media, but it creates more social media interaction than many of the gadgets we could invest in. Yeah. So one of the big topics in the book is this notion that you mentioned of meaning, right? And the importance of meaning. Um, you mentioned something of a, a third wave 
uh, serving humanity. So perhaps you want to go into the story of the, the waves themselves and this whole, the title of the book and the meaning and, and what, how this ties into that. We've always talked about change in business uh, as waves, waves of change. What we see right now changing is so dramatic, the only way we can really compare it is a tsunami. And we saw the tsunami that hit Japan in about 2011, which very much aligns with the social media revolution and everything that was taking place. At that time when a tsunami hit, uh, a lot of times we think that the first wave is so big that you know it takes the city out by surprise. But in reality, it's a lot, not, not always the first wave. It's typically there's a small wave, then a big wave comes in and people think, wow, that was amazing. That was you know, 20 foot or 10 foot wave, it blows their minds. And mm -hmm. people start gathering around to look at the aftermath and they don't know what's coming, but there's another 70 foot wave coming to hit the shoreline because the, the buildup of waves is a series. And so we look at technology change as the same kind of thing. There was a big wave that hit culture uh, in the 19, early 1900s called the Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Age. And that shift took us from an agri agricultural society, I'm sorry, an agricultural society to an industrial society. The next shift that came was very big and it was the information age and it changed the way we got information. We gathered more content, we were able to learn more and, and we were no longer differentiated over uh, those who had knowledge and those who did not. Suddenly we all, all had access. The third wave that we see coming is that tsunami, that black wave. A black wave is when it hits the shore so hard that the soot and the oil from the bottom actually comes up into the wave and the wave churns up and it, this is nothing like out of the Caribbean when you're surfing. This is a black, oily, dark, 70 foot wave that's coming at you. And this wave is so big, it's shifting the way we're gonna engage with consumers and they're going to engage with brands. And what it looks like is this, we see it as the age of participation. In other words, the participation age is when consumers now have a voice. They now have their own blog, their own web page, their own company. You have your own broadcast network. 20, 30 years ago, there wasn't that opportunity. You had to have a million dollar satellite dish. You had to have all this access. Now influence is available to all and all want to participate. This is the participation age. Hmm. Now, getting to back to meaning and what you mentioned yeah. is the third wave in serving humanity. And uh, another thing you mentioned, too, was uh, brand advocates are inspired when the brand does good, creating movements, right. which uh, was really fascinating to me. Can you, can you expand on that? When, uh, when you look at just the evolution of the way brands have kind of engaged consumers, in the first wave, let's look at the industrial age. It was all about product. If you sold coffee, you all you had to do is label the cup of coffee, and that was all the information you needed to buy a 50 cent cup of coffee. The next stage was more about relationships. In the industrial age, we had all this connection to people, and humanity started connecting to each other, and we wanted to know the differences between brands beyond the coffee value itself. What's the price? What's the flavor? I want to know what's the relationship I have to you. Brands like Starbucks evolved and they started creating environments where people would have relationships with each other and they would have a relationship with their barista. Uh, we're working with brands like uh, another coffee house, uh, Big B Coffee. They've actually created a brand now. They're calling Love People is their brand wow. because they really, really want to start engaging people. And as this evolution starts taking place, we're seeing that the third wave is even bigger. This is where on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we go beyond the basic human need at the bottom, we move up to, in psychology, they call the next wave. It's, it's about that relationship, that social need. Uh, the, the pinnacle and the top of all human needs is purpose. It's identity, it's self-actualization. The idea that I stand for something and I want my brands that I buy from to stand for something too. And I really believe this is where we're moving with millennials because they are cause-minded. They're not just looking at price and product. All of that's commoditized now. Now they want to know, what does your brand stand for? So when I walk into a Starbucks, we look around now, it, is there a Green Planet initiative? Is there something about the way you're, you're cooking your beans that you're taking care of the, the, the planet and the way you do that? But beyond that, the people who do it, are you taking care of your employees? I want to know that you're taking care of your staff, that you're treating people with respect, now your coffee and your flavor and your price and all that is wrapped up in a bigger picture 
not of what you are and what you sell, I want to know what you stand for. And if I believe in what you stand for, if you're, for example, Big B is now coming out against Starbucks, they're saying, we stand for loving people. So if you walk into our store, we're going to give you an experience that helps you love your life, helps you love each other. And, and by the way, we sell coffee as a part of that experience. Now you've got a contender who says, this is the next wave. This is a new level of competition. It's about values and it's about what we stand for as brands. Can you talk That's about the, social media and how it re relates to this as well? In the, in the book, you mentioned that purpose-driven brands movement uh, is magnified by social media. Absolutely. Uh, in the social media environment, we try to say things like, you know, back to the coffee analogy, it's on sale for 20 cents off or it's on sale for this price or that price. How many of us have ever shared a meme like that? We see 1,700 banner ads every month. How many do you remember? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult because we're very banner blind to this. Mm -hmm. So we see all this content. This is on sale this week. That's on sale that week. So price is always out there. But someone then introduces a new idea. They say, hey, by the way, this is uh, Valentine's Day. So when you buy a cup, we're going to let you give a cup as well. And so now go out there and take care of the people you love. Give one on, on Secretary's Day. Give one to your daughter. Bring your daughter to the office this week and give her a cup of coffee. Now it's about relationship and it's about love and it's about things that really we never use these words in business before. And people are starting to use these words and differentiating their brand on things that hit the emotional human level. Interesting. So yeah, so touching on that, you say emotional thought is not the opposite of rational thought. And uh, can, can you touch on that, what that Absolutely. means? So in the past, we used to think that um, words like uh, emotion, uh, words like entertainment, these were fr frivolous things, irrelevant to life, that, you know, mm -hmm. intellectual thought, the things we understand is what matters. More and more, we're learning from science that our emotions drive our decisions and they're not frivolous. Mm -hmm. Emotions are many times scientifically, we're understanding that our brain has a, a, a thought pattern so complex, we can't understand it. So we call it emotion, but it's thinking through and making decisions on our behalf that are many times protecting us beyond what we can understand. So for example, when you choose a doctor, the studies show that 70% of your choice will be around the emotional impact you've made when you connect with a doctor or you see a doctor that you feel good about. That feeling, that sense of I trust you is 70% of the factor. The 30% is how are you ranked as a neurosurgeon in the country? What is your, uh, what is your case count? What kinds of programs do you have for uh, payment? Those were 30% of the equation. 70% of that decision, mm -hmm. this is a Gallup poll, 70% mm -hmm. of the decision is what do I feel? The emotions are making that decision. And yet think about this, if that's your doctor decision, think about how much emotion plays in choosing bubble gum or a Coca-Cola or yeah. the food you're going to eat. All of those decisions are even more so affected by emotions. That's real. That's so powerful. I know one of the things you mentioned too is a uh, faith-based or vision concepts testing better than rankings and outcomes messaging. Yes, uh, well, that was actually a health system, uh, CHI, CHI St. Vincent in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Now that's in the Bible Belt. We did yeah. a test among consumers in that marketplace. And we said, for a doctor, would you like a top 1% ranked neurosurgeon or would you like a doctor who prays every day? And the, in that market, it's you know, obviously a faith-based community, values drive the people in that market and their values are very much about their faith. So they said, I would much rather choose a doctor who prays for me before I get surgery than a doctor who's ranked number one in the marketplace for neurosciences. Wow. That was an interesting finding. Now, when you ask a consumer, is faith more important or is capability more important? They'll typically say, no, 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 I want capability. But then when we would show a, a creative experience, an emotional engagement, like a TV commercial or a digital ad, some kind of music-oriented, visually stimulating experience, people will always lean in on that emotional engagement that ties to their sense of values and their sense of identity. They buy products from doctors to a car based on saying, not, that's what I want, mm -hmm. but that's who I am. Mm -hmm. Just think about the car you drive. Is that car you drive the highest quality, best price that you could pop possibly get? 
Or does that car identify with who you are? Many times that's the choice we make. Wow. So this could really position brands based on geographic region. It can sort of trap them in various corners, couldn't it? Oh, absolutely. We did the same test about, for example, doctors in uh, St. Louis. And uh, the consumer there said, I could care less if my doctor prayed or didn't. Mm -hmm. I, I want to know that they're ranked best. I want to know their education. So you can go into different markets. You're going to have a different experience. But in those other markets, interestingly, they didn't say they want the best scientists. They didn't say they wanted the top, grading, the top graded doctor by some outside third party scoring system. They said, I want a doctor who's going to listen to me. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. crazy if you think about it from an intellectual and cognitive standpoint. Right. Why would listening even matter if that doctor doesn't bother to follow through on a good procedure? But the consumer says, if that doctor listens to me, I trust that they're taking their information right, and I trust they're going to give me better care. So I'd rather have a doctor who listens to me than one who's ranked in U.S. News and World Report. Amazing. As you mentioned, that can apply across the board in all kinds of ways, which is just incredible when you think about it. Now, one of the points that you mentioned in the book are, are proof points, right? You say proof points are not better. They distract from the job of advertising. What does that mean? Well, many times when you're in advertising or marketing, you get, you get this obsessive need based on research and based on features and benefits, what you believe a, a customer really wants. They'll tell you that these are the features I want. I want on my car, I want ABS brakes and power windows, and I want uh, leather seats. So then we make TV commercials that say, and this car has ABS brakes and power windows and leather seats. And the consumer says, I could care less. <laughs> and some commercial comes running through with a rap artist or a Hollywood movie star and lots of music and people buy that car with no description whatsoever. Hmm. Why is that? Because the human mind is emotionally tied to identity. They call it the identity economics. It's very hmm. much tied to behavioral economics. People don't make decisions based on best price, best features. Those are, those are the, use, the, the, the information our left brain uses to identify and say, okay, I'm going to rationalize what my emotions really want to do. How many of us got out an Excel spreadsheet when we were picking out our spouse or uh, someone to date <laughs> and said, well, these are the basic features. Here's, here are the height restrictions and here's you know, blonde, brunette. We, we don't spend the time to rationalize the, for me, for the, my wife that I, that I chose until after we've emotionally engaged and says, I like her. Hmm. I simply like her. And that right side of our brain that is very emotionally driven is thinking through a lot of things that I can't even understand or articulate. But I have to trust that because my brain knows what it's doing. That's fascinating. That could be like, I'm a, I'm a Land Rover guy and I drive into a city. Why would I ever need that, right? Right, right. But, there's a, but that's not about getting over a big hill for you. That's not why you bought it. You bought it because you are building a brand for yourself. You're building an identity, a community that you want to be recognized by. And when you drive in that versus I drive a Jeep, uh, yeah. You know, that's one of my pers right. personas. No, I drive a Prius, actually, but yeah. Okay, well, I, yeah, I have a Maserati as well. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but it depends on the day. I'm trying to be a different person. We sure. identify yeah. ourselves with these things. I said Jeep first because I more think of myself as a Jeep rider. I want to go out and do my kiteboarding. and sure. I want to do my wakeboarding, drive the beat Jeep to the beach. Yeah. That's who I am. That's right. how I identify my value system. Right. And in the book, you do mention kiteboarding and changing the wind, the changing winds of business. Can you can you expand on on that? Why you use that analogy yeah. and the topic you were discussing? Yeah, it's very much uh, an experience for me. My friends got me into. I do a lot of action sports, and my friends got me into kiteboarding. Which uh, now I'm getting, you know, now that I'm eking on you know, 50 years old, I'm pushing my limits. <laughs> yeah. But I said I'm going to go out Same and here. try this thing, and. Um, Going online before you head out there, you see people going 50 feet or 100 feet in the air, catching yeah. a wind that throws yeah. them into a parking lot and sometimes wow. into a hotel. So I said, you know what, I'm going to get some pro uh, instruction and I'm going to do this the right way. Wow. And I went out with some pros and they taught me a lot of technique. And one of the things I learned about kiteboarding is that it's all about understanding the winds. It's all about getting your gauges right and following and tracking to make sure you're not going to get blown out to sea. Uh, one of the instructors taught me an unsettling lesson about how to stay afloat on your kite out at sea, which 
uh, was a very much a, a, a moment where I said, I think I'm going to pay attention <laughs> to what we're learning here. And when I was learning these lessons, I said, wait a minute, this is a lot like our marketing environment today, a lot mm -hmm. like building a brand. Because when you're going into social media, you want to engage what people want to engage in. And those wins, they're going to go where they're going to go. When the consumer wants to talk about the green planet, you can have all this agenda you want about saving money. Mm. But they could really care less about the money you're going to save them. They want to have a green plan. So mm. let's have that conversation. And when the consumer wants to go somewhere else, let's say they want to talk about uh, the uh, transgender bathrooms, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe they want to have that conversation. Well, it's a little bit more dangerous territory now because now mm -hmm. you, you, you can find a large audience who will follow the green planet conversation. But it becomes very divisive and divided when you mm -hmm. start picking a conversation where our country is a little bit more split. So mm -hmm. these are dangerous waters. When you go into those waters, you can take a strong stand on one side or the other. But as soon as you do that, you've taken a risk with your brand because half of that customer base that you've been talking to, you will lose that customer. You might win over one, but you lose the other. So you've got to be very careful in following what the consumer really wants to talk about. But if you ignore what they want to talk about, you're just blowing in the wind. You literally will never be heard. Very interesting. Gosh, I mean, it's so tough these days for these businesses. I really yeah. feel for them all. Um, so one of the themes throughout the book I've noticed that was sort of peppered throughout the book is you mentioned Walt Disney quite a bit and, the, and his philosophies. Uh, tell us about the impact that, that he had on you and, and why you mentioned him throughout. Uh, yeah, I really uh, look to various types of leaders in history when I'm trying to learn leadership style. And, you know, I have a lot of people I'm responsible to. I, I speak to groups and CEOs and I help uh, marketing directors and uh, try to resolve brand issues. As, as I'm doing that, I want to take best practices and learn from history. Uh, a few people that stand out uh, really uh, among them is Walt Disney. Walt Disney was loved by his people. He was loved by the consumer. Uh, his brand stood for something that people valued and they trusted him to deliver over and over the quality product that he did. And so I studied the, his history. I've read biographies. I've met with people who, who knew him, who worked with him. And in, over the years, I've learned a lot of lessons from Walt Disney. Uh, the things that we don't know about Walt is that he was not only a cartoonist and an animator and a theme park guy, he was actually an innovator. He was a disruptive innovator. He was not, you know, Mickey Mouse, for example. We might think that was a really great cartoon. Well, mm -hmm. there were a lot of cartoons like Mickey Mouse at the time. He was really not outstanding, except for one fact. It was the very first cartoon that had sync sound. So when mm -hmm. Mickey Mouse came out, Disney was the guy who said, I'm going to sync up his voice to the animation. And wow. for the first time, people mm -hmm. are going to see an animated character actually talk. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, Mickey Mouse became magical not because he was better than the mouse or bunny or whatever else was done before. It was because he was scientifically the first technologically speaking mouse in the planet. And after that, he saw Technicolor. And he said, well, this is a great technology. For two years, I'm going to license Technicolor and be the only color cartoon in the marketplace wow. before anybody else catches up. So Disney was two years out ahead. And then when it came to the feature movie, um, it was um, Snow White. At that time, no one had ever done a feature film. Wow. Disney said, I'm not going to be the best animated feature film. I'll be the only. And by Phew. being the only, Disney stepped out and was first. And, and I think a lot of people say, well, I'd like to be like Disney. Let's make animated cartoons. Let's make theme parks. Disney would have been way, way down the path somewhere else by now because he was always going to that next thing. Well, wow. yeah, I, I, it seems like just now – Walt Disney seems to be getting his due. We just spoke with another CEO, um, Tom Bill Yu, the CEO of Quest Nutrition and Impact Theory, and he also brought up uh, Walt Disney quite a bit, the biography yeah. and, and all these things too. So it's fascinating how now he was so ahead of his time, Walt was, oh that, that we're just starting to just now sort of grasp the impact beyond what I thought was, as you mentioned, sort of kids' movies, you know, and amazing kids' oh, yeah. movies. Oh, yeah, he came, uh, and I'm from Detroit, and I'm really intrigued by all the innovation that came out of the industrial age. That was mm -hmm. the very first wave, and it actually started in our city. Wow. And there's all kinds of stories in the book about that, about how the first wave doesn't carry you all the way. Detroit's had a really rough time in the last, yeah. you know, the last about a decade ago. We hit our mm -hmm. wall. And it's because we were still riding on the first wave, talking about product, talking about ABS brakes, talking mm -hmm. about 
power windows. Mm -hmm. And we are missing the relational impact of a vehicle. We are missing the impact of what's going on now. Now we're starting to make that shift, but it took a long, long time to catch up. Well, Walt Disney actually came to Detroit uh, to the Henry Ford Museum uh, to understand the technology and the innovation that was taking place here back in the 50s and 60s and to understand where he was going with his innovation. Mm -hmm. So this was actually a source of a lot of his innovation thinking. And, uh, and I find that interesting as well. Hmm. Now, in the book, one of the r really big revelations for, for me was not so much Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I, which I knew about, was this whole notion of the importance, how we perhaps he had it wrong. And then you hmm. mentioned uh, inverting it. Can you touch on that? Yes. For those who know Maslow's hierarchy, uh, uh, give me a second to kind of establish what it is. It's a pyramid of the importance of needs of having things in life to be satisfied as a human. At the base of that pyramid, we all need food and shelter. Um, moving up the ladder, we have uh, belonging needs. We need to be a part of a community. And then we move up toward ego needs. We need to have influence. We, need to, we go from being children to wanting to be fathers. We want to be mentors. And at the very top of the pinnacle, we, we have a need for self-actualization. This is when the billionaire has everything he'll ever need, and he gives 80% of it away. This is where, you know, maybe for us, uh, you know, Bill Gates is now changing the world with his, his finances. Uh, this is where you start giving back. You start realizing none of those other things are going to fulfill me anymore. I need to have purpose. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting question that Maslow and many others started asking later in his life is if the base human need is, is safety and shelter, why would a, a military guy fall on a grenade for his friends? Mm -hmm because that's not safety and shelter. That doesn't make any sense. Why would he do that if the base need that he needed before anything else was established in his life, why would that matter? And then going to the next question, why would anybody commit suicide if the base human need is safety? Hmm. So there's something in the pyramid that's missing. The hmm. base human need is not safety. As a matter of fact, at the end of his life, Maslow said, maybe I've got it wrong. And, and I believe it's upside down that if you turn the pyramid upside down, if you take away purpose from someone's life, they have no hope. Mm -hmm. When they have no hope, that's when we walk towards suicide. That's mm -hmm. when we don't feed ourselves. That's when we don't earn sh you know, income and have shelter and we don't make friends and all these terrible things happen to us. So mm -hmm. the base human need is not food. The base human need is purpose. The base right. human need is having a reason to live your life, not for self, but for others. Right. And it's a very unique insight to the human brain. I think if anything, that's a, that's a huge point that everyone should really sort of absorb and digest. That, that was one that really hit me like a ton of breaks when I was reading the book. So thank you for that. <clears throat> now, um, in the book also, you mentioned Trump, right? <laughs> <laughs> Going on to another, yeah, as a, how's that for a 90 degree turn? Uh, he's part of the book, he's part of the, you know, the fabric of what's happening now, obviously. Right. Uh, right. And why and what can we learn from him? And, um, you know, you, you, we talked briefly about divisions in the country and trapping brands. Um, right. Can you expand on that? Well, this is one of those subjects, just like I mentioned with the kite board, where the winds are strong and there's times where you want to stay out of the winds. Mm. And uh, this is one of those subjects. If you talk about Trump on the social media, you're going to have a conversation. <laughs> People will join the conversation. Yeah. You may have lots of conversation and it may never end, yeah. but it may not be the conversation you necessarily want. Yeah. And so this is the danger of it. How many friends have we lost because we talked about Trump? Mm. How many times have we maybe even hurt relationships that we were trying to build because we just simply brought the subject up? Mm -hmm. And these are the dangers of social media. Social media becomes divisive because we simplify things of right and wrong and good and bad and your side, my side. And we don't get deep into the relationships of people, but we talk on these surface levels in social media. So it's very dangerous, very heated and very dangerous on these subjects. Um, Trump was a subject that we studied because we wanted to understand what was going on with the marketing, not necessarily the politics and why and Russia and all that. We just wanted to remove all the noise and say, what was going on in social media at that time? What's interesting when you look at the study, early on, uh, way before we got to the you know discussions about uh, WikiLeaks and uh, leaks and all the different stories that were getting out there, Trump was taking a big, big lead in social media. 
Uh, mm -hmm. We were watching early on in the, even in the preliminary uh, start of the campaigns, the, all of the Republicans versus Trump, Trump had more social media followers. All of the Democrats versus Trump, Trump had more. He actually had more than either party combined. Mm -hmm. So that was early on. A lot of this was based on his, he already had a following. He was in entertainment. He had his own television show. So that we don't all have our own TV show. Mm -hmm. uh, not, we don't all have our blog and, and, and video cast online. Sure. But Trump had a huge following. That mm -hmm. following built a base. Then he went to the next level and he started using new, new techniques. Um, some people don't know of Cambridge Analytica, but that's the organization that was hired during the Brexit campaign. Cambridge right. Analytica broke down every human. So we now have 100, 220 million human profiles in America, every adult, ranked and ratified by their value system, by their political stand, by their religion. All these things are now online about me and you right now. Right. Cambridge Analytica was hired by Trump. What they did is they divided the country into uh, the, the 175,000 different profiles. There was the hunter. There was the pro-life activist. There was the, uh, the construction worker, the coal miner. All these individuals each got their own messages on what we call dark post social media. So for example, if he was to say, hey, coal miners, we're gonna increase more coal production in this country, that sounds great to the coal miner because that sounds like a job. Mm -hmm. But if that same message got out to a, an environmentalist, well, that could work against Trump. Mm -hmm. So what he would do is send only that message only to that coal miner. And so then that's why when you saw all these crazy different things going out in the, mar in the marketplace and everybody's trying to track down all these messages, there, there were 175,000 messages. You couldn't possibly track it all down. And Trump was keeping them dark. They were going up and they were going down. Mm -hmm. so, he, so his then his policies looked really disjointed because they were, <laughs> it was that simple. Mm -hmm. He was disjointing, connecting to individuals emotionally on their own personal issues. And I can't say pretending to accomplish, to do everything he was saying he was going to do, but in some ways it was impossible for him to ever achieve all that was promised to all the different individuals out there. Right. It, was, it seemed incredibly strategic. It caught many of us in Silicon Valley off guard, obviously. You know, right. and what we were surprised that people, our, our audience at NerdStalker too, heavily tech individuals, entrepreneurs, that kind of thing, that are very hip to all of this uh, big data as well. And people, you know, give whatever you may think about it, audience members out there. When people ask me, how do you think that he won? I always say marketing. It was a master marketing sort of effort, in, in, in my opinion, in a well, way. The poll that was overlooked, I, if you'd have been watching the social media, there would have been no surprises. Mm. Uh, the poll that was overlooked was uh, followers and fans who were watching his content. Uh, there was 62% of all online social engagement was Trump's. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Clinton, by the end, only had 38%. So if you look at just that social media following, the fan base, he had the voice. He had his own media channel. And he had bypassed what we had always traditionally thought is the media. CNN, you know, MSNBC, Fox, all of them, even the conservative news media didn't have a clue what was, what was going on because it wasn't about them. It was yeah. about social media. And for the first time, digital had, I guess, you know, for sake of a um, pun, digital had trumped uh, the traditional media system. Uh, so let's get back into or let's get into advertising in, in general, the industry itself. Um, those of us in tech have and that are close to advertising, I'm particularly close to it uh, through family and things like that, uh, have witnessed a lot of, let's say, inefficiencies in the traditional sort of model. And for me as an outsider and technically inclined, I've seen a lot of opportunity there, let's just call it that, to streamline, improve production flow, different methodologies perhaps, uh, ways of doing business. Are you seeing this in, as well? It seems like you are. That I'm getting a sense of that. And I'm, you know, there are other talking heads, as we know on the internet, that have joined into the media fray uh, and created advertising companies, let's say, um, who are also espousing this, the value of things like uh, social influencers and such. Can you, can you touch on the industry as a whole? Right. Um, it used to be about what we could buy and what we could say. 
and we had complete control. We had three channels back when I was a kid, and mm -hmm. those three channels controlled all media all the time. And so the mindset of advertising was we can reach 99% of our audience in the first three weeks with three impressions, and we had math around this. It was really easy. We just talked to everybody. Mm -hmm. Then it became 100 channels. Then it became 1,000 channels. Now we have a million channels. And it's much, much more difficult to track down that customer. Mm -hmm. And so what has happened in the digital arena, now we can track it. And sometimes it's not such a good thing. We can track that we didn't measure it to reach as many people as we thought. We could go now on traditional TV for eight weeks and never reach more than 60% of the customer um, that we want to reach. And that's that's been very recent that that shift took place. It, the, the customer has moved away from traditional TV. They've moved to Netflix. There's no advertising on Netflix. So what do we do about that? And then when they're in the digital space, we be, we've gone banner blind to that top space and that side panel. What's over there? I, I, I don't know. We can literally have a thousand ads go by us that we never even saw. But in that middle news feed, that's been very effective. And we're, we track this and we understand how many clicks. We know exactly, for example, I have a, a, a pizza client we work with where I know the cost to get a pizza sale. I can narrow it down. That If a person clicks on this banner and goes to that space and buys a pizza, they'll spend exactly X number of dollars on average. And we can calculate the cost of getting that customer into the cost of the pizza. Mm -hmm. So that's something you could never do before. It's mm -hmm. good news, bad news. If you do something that doesn't work, everybody knows. Mm -hmm. If you do something that does work, well, let's keep doing that and let's do that better. And so now advertising is about improvement. It's about patient, and, and, and uh, it's about the, I, I jumped to healthcare. It's about patient pathways and, and, uh, and understanding that patient from the very beginning all the way to the end mm -hmm. and then taking care of that patient digitally after they've left to remind them to take their medicine. And in, in pizza, it's about, finding that customer and then tracking them all the way to the, the mobile app. Well, I'm going to download and reorder and reorder and reorder. Mm -hmm. And 67% of the people who download an app for a pizza company will come back and reorder and reorder and reorder. And they stop using independent pizza chains. Amazing. So we're literally seeing independent chains with no technology falling off the map right now. They're dropping 10, 15, 20% in sales per year where these digitally savvy companies are growing by the same amount. Mm -hmm. So the shift is moving toward these digitally analytic based organizations that know their customer pathway. And, and that's what we're, we're all about now is tracking that customer from the very first connection point to the third ad they saw to the time they finally purchased all that happening online now. Fascinating. So advertising companies are uh, in effect becoming, well, this is probably oversimplification data companies in a way, right? Very much. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. We are analytics nerds, and uh, nerd stalker is a great, a great title for your show, by the way. <laughs> but it, it, that's us now. We, we started as artists. Uh, I was an artist as a kid, and mm, I wanted to make films, and I loved making movies and stuff like that. But wow. now it's gone into applications, and we're making technology, and we've had to learn things that we didn't plan on learning. And um, it's exciting. If you're an innovator and you love creating things, it's just a new thing to create, right? Right. That's so interesting. You're the third CEO, I believe, that we've spoken to that has a film background. And when I'm, fi I'm finding this correlation between the importance of storytelling and, and that type of thing with, with the knowledge of filmmaking and business. Yeah, absolutely. Storytelling is the story making of our brands. Mm. When you tell stories, you're creating structures in people's brains. They remember. When I tell you of the wave, that wave stays there. And you think yeah. you can picture a wave where you either ride the wave or it crushes you. Right. And so this idea that you, yeah, I don't want to do innovation. I don't feel like I need to. I don't want to take the risk. There's actually more risk in not riding the wave because that thing's going to take you out. If you're a surfer, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So yeah. many times these analogies, these structures in our brain, they tell us of other things. Uh, stories stay in our brain much more sticky than facts and figures and data. Mm -hmm. And so we love the idea of storytelling because it builds thoughts and patterns and makes customers have very quick reactions to why I believe in that brand. Right. And simple visuals help us do that. Right. And there's an emotional connection, all kinds of things as well, you know, that people right. really grasp onto. Now you touch on this really beautiful story uh, of these Japanese children 
in yes. in the book as well. Can you briefly, I want to be respectful of your time, but uh, brief, briefly uh, touch on that story because it's so important. It's such a crux to, uh, to the book itself. Right. So at the uh, beginning of the book, we get into the story of the miracle of Kamiyashi. It's a story. I, I did not know about this story too. It's so fascinating. It's a true story a, too. Right? It is an amazing story. Uh, these kids are national heroes. Films and documentaries have been done in Japan yeah. about them. Uh, they were children who were 3,000 students in a school that was right on the shore of Kamaishi Bay. Kamaishi Bay was hit hardest. There was actually a big wall, uh, massive, massive wall out in the shoreline that was so, supposed to protect that shoreline. And uh, they called it the Great Wall of Japan. It was uh, some 200 feet tall, uh, and it was supposed to withstand any kind of tsunami. But uh, unfortunately, that wall didn't stand like they thought it would. And uh, the school was taken out completely. The, the school was wiped out. There was nothing left of it. Mm -hmm. So we would have thought these children were just devastated, but there was not a single life lost among these children in Kamaishi Bay. So people were trying to figure out what happened because you know tsunami drills happened in all the schools. This school had tsunami drills, but didn't they didn't have the same success in other uh, other places? And these children were much closer to the shore. There was much less likelihood of them surviving. Why did they survive? Uh, and so there was a, a guy named uh, Toshitaka Katada. He was a professor of engineering at a local university and he'd been studying the tsunamis and the third wave and the phenomenon that took place in Hawaii where the story in Hawaii was um, there, it, there was a school there. The school was not, um, uh, not aware of how tsunamis work. And so there was a, a wave that came in from a tsunami and many of the villagers and the children rushed to the shoreline because they saw it rush back out and they saw that the, the sand dried up and they saw fish flopping and mm -hmm. the water line went over the shore, literally over the horizon. And they said, wow, this is a weird ph phenomenon. What's happening? Well, the third wave was still coming mm -hmm. and that city was wiped out and the children were lost. What Takata said was, I'm not going to let, let that happen in my town. I'm going to teach these children the principles of tsunami so that when one comes to our town, it won't impact our kids. And he taught three incredible principles. Um, and one of the principles uh, that I start out in the book with is this, that you should follow the principles, not the pathways. And he taught the kids to rebel against the, the standard protocol of this is the safe zone, run to the safe zone, because safe zones change, because earthquakes change topography, waterways change. And so in a tsunami, nothing is the same and you can't trust the pathways that were taught before you. And so when, when kind of taught these children, what happened was they ran to the top of the hill where they were supposed to, they were in their safe zone. And one of the kids remembered a lesson and said, follow principles, not pathways. One of the principles is go to high ground and I'm not done. We can keep going higher. And the kids did, they went higher. And as they turned around and watched the area in the safe zone they were supposed to be in, it got enveloped by the tsunami and it came up in a plume of smoke with the earthquake. Mm -hmm. And they would have all been taken out. But it was because they listened to three principles. The first one was follow principles, not pathways. And the other two, you're going to have to read the book to figure out what those were. <laughs> and it's, it's incredible, too, because one of the things where so many, these, despite these, children's, these children survived and so many adults, unfortunately, passed. And, right. And, and not only that, some of these children, you could see the path of some of these children who are moving slower. And what they were doing right. is they were helping some of like the elderly or, or like the, what was it, some, some disabled children disabled as well? Children. Yes. They, as a matter of fact, one of the principles that he got into in, um, uh, in the first point was be a leader, not a follower. And kids were, you know, in Japan, it's traditionally taught to kids to learn to follow, to, you know, get in line, to be part of the system, to do well. Mm -hmm. But these kids were not taught that. They were taught to be a leader to step mm -hmm. up first when no one was at, no one was saying run, run, and, and to grab the hands. These are children. children little, little kids, yeah. <laughs> they're saying grab other people's hands. And so they're gra grabbing elderly hands and they're grabbing their parents and telling them we need to go to high ground. Mm -hmm. And the children literally saved faculty members and saved mm -hmm. uh, their parents and little other little children in, in places where there wouldn't have been a chance for any of them if the children hadn't driven the way they did. Yeah, amazing. You guys, you know, check it out. Surfing the Black Wave. 
brand leadership in the digital age. Now, one of the one of the final questions, Dan, that we like to ask our guests is, um, what are you currently reading, and what is what are the books, media, movies, whatever lectures that sort of influenced you through your life to sort of get you where you're at now? I'm a big uh, Jim Collins fan. I love his books. Uh, I think he's always he's always made a lot of sense to me and. Uh, you know the, the the principles in good great is is I think mm-hmm. you know almost the Bible of business to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I look at autobiographies. I, I'm still mm-hmm. reading more Disney autobiographies, uh, Steve Jobs biographies. Uh, the uh, I, I've been reading interesting. I love brain science, so I've been studying a lot of different types of brain science. And I also believe in this sense that when science aligns with philosophy, and that aligns to what a lot of people call religion, and it all says the same thing that finds a common truth that I think is above things that previously existed. And mm-hmm. we're getting to an age where a lot of that's starting to happen. We're, mm-hmm. we're not differentiated between the three. Mm-hmm. And there's an there's a author I've been reading, uh, Greg Braden, uh, The Divine Matrix, and how things work and how our brain works and how we interact with each other. Uh, when, when you and I talk, there is a brain pattern that goes similar inside of both of our brains at the same time beyond the words we speak. So that says something about the way humans interact, that we participate with each other. We don't just talk at each other. We actually have a connection. And I think that's really interesting. Hmm. So Dan, where can we get more information about you, what you're doing, the future of what you're up to, and all the things, whatever you want to share? Uh, you can learn more about the book at surfingtheblackwave.com, surfingtheblackwave.com. And you can go to my website for my advertising agency, danielbryan.com, danielbryan, D-A-N-I-E-L, B-R-I-A-N.com. And uh, you can learn about what we're doing. We, we're the agency for Chick-fil-A. We're the agency that does daddy-daughter date nights and creates experiences that you see all over the internet. You see, yeah. might see work that we do for energy companies and hospitals and banks and all kinds of brands. But uh, all of it is around this subject matter we call better brands for a better human condition. Because we believe that when you make a difference in society, society pays you back. And that's how brands are leading in the digital age. Great. All right, everyone. As you know, I am Adolfo Fronda at NerdStalker on Twitter. Subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. You'll see some stuff up here. If you're listening on iTunes, give us a nice uh, thank you, ratings, five stars, and the whole thing. Again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being on the show, Dan. You're welcome. All right. See you guys next time. You bet. All right.